Well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, this is a uh, topic that uh, is always in the news, as we are all know. Uh, vulnerabilities and components, whether we use them or not, um, is uh, the subject of many breaches. So in this talk, we're going to be talking about the ability to continuously analyze our components for various types of things, regardless of whether or not that software is being built or not. So um, Dependency Track is a open source continuous component analysis platform. Gartner and Forrester may call that software composition analysis. I think that's a terrible term. Uh, it doesn't take in environmental things, runtime, uh, and it's specific to software. And as we all know, hardware also has vulnerabilities, and Dependency Track can monitor those components as well. Um, dependency Track works on the concept of software bill of materials, where basically we tell Dependency Track factually what components we have. Um, from then, it um, it monitors all of the components that it's tracking for known vulnerabilities as well as out-of-date components. Um, out-of-date components is really, really important because only a small portion of all publicly disclosed vulnerabilities, of, of all vulnerabilities, excuse me, are actually published to things like the NVD. So it's always a good practice to stay up to date. It does track open source license. Uh, this is not a, um, uh, a strategic part of the project. The evidence is there, we will use it, but being an OWASP project, I really i am focused more on the security aspects not necessarily the license and compliance aspects, although I do accept pull requests. Um, it has a auditing workflow. Uh, much like static analysis tools, fortify, check marks, et cetera, um, you have a bunch of findings, and those findings may or may not be relevant to your particular product uh, that you're working on, so you can mark things as false positives, maybe you can mark them as not applicable to your application, you can produce a comment trail, um, you have a complete audit history, uh, as well as make, marking things as uh, uh, being suppressed so that your metrics and whatnot are, um, are, are nicely affected by that. And finally, it's built really for DevOps, and, and I, it's designed with, a, with an API-first design, but I think some of the features in here, you'll see that we, 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 don't, also, we don't just embrace DevOps from the automation standpoint. We, we do kind of embrace the, the cultural aspect uh, in dependency track as well, and I think we do a pretty good job of that. So what is the software bill of material? It's a list, right? It's just a list of things that we have. It is a list of ingredients that our software, our in an, in an IoT device, our pacemaker, whatever it is that we are working on, it is a list of all the ingredients that goes into that thing. So conceptually, <coughs> Dependency track is this. You have an asset, piece of software, a microservice, pacemaker. Um, you create a bill of material for that that describes all the ingredients. And you throw it into dependency track where it will constantly monitor it, whether you're building that software or not. Now, the generation of the bill of material is really simple to do. Uh, it can be automated. And this is ideal to be put into a CI CD pipeline. So you're constantly generating the bill of materials and you're putting it to dependency track on a continuous basis. And you basically end up with a loop within a loop, right? So you're continuously analyzing things, uh, whether or not you are building them or not. So, and this is really important. Um, when organizations create software, they typically create multiple versions or support multiple versions of the same thing. And you might be at version 3.0, but you still have some 1.0 in the field and you still support it, but you don't build it every day. But you still want to check your components, right? Well, you might have a bunch of microservices. Say, for example, you've got hundreds or thousands of microservices. These development teams, they go from one service to the next to the next. Um, outside of a few core services that are really important to your business, you're not working on all thousand services all the time, right? But you still need to monitor those without necessarily having to build everything all the time. So the types of analysis that we do, vulnerabilities, outdated components. 
So for vulnerabilities, we check the NVD. Uh, we integrate natively with NPM public repositories using NPM Audit API. Uh, big thanks to Sonotype for supporting OSS index and rolling that out. And we've got partial support for VolnDB. We're kind of working on that a little bit um, as, we, as we go forward. For outdated components, we currently support RubyGems. Uh, there's like nine or 10 Maven, public Maven repositories that we support. Uh, NPM uh, and NuGet is in development. So bill of material support, we support two different types of bill of materials, Cyclone DX and SPDX. Uh, Cyclone DX uh, was written specifically for dependency track. Um, it is a very lightweight specification. Uh, it is designed uh, to be essentially the, the minimal viable product of what a bill of material should be with an application security focus. So um, it is the recommended way um, to, to do this. Um, SPDX is also supported. SPDX is a much older bill of material specification. It's used by Black Duck and a few others. Uh, but it has historically focused mostly on license, copyright, compliance, that type of thing. Uh, there is a new version of SPDX coming up, uh, version 2.2, which I, at that point, I'll also be able to say that that's also recommended. Although not a bill of material, uh, we also can depend, uh, ingest uh, dependency check reports as well. So generating a bomb is really simple. Um, you basically start with something that's native to your ecosystem, Maven, NPM, uh, there's a .NET Core module, there's other things in development. Uh, the specification is really super simple to understand. Uh, you could probably create something for Ruby or Python in a few hours, actually have something of production quality within a day, maybe two if you're slow. Uh, but it's really, really simple to get started. This is what a bill of material actually looks like. Um, for the sake of screen real estate, I only have one bill of material listed here. But as you can see, this is a type of library. Uh, it's REST easy from the, the JBoss project. Uh, it's got a bunch of file hashes. It, it has the SPDX license ID. And then it has this thing called, called Perl or package URL. This thing is very, very important. Um, it is a standardized based way to represent your components irregardless of uh, what ecosystem uh, that component is a part of. So instead of having Maven Gauze or you know, the Ruby version of that or the NPM, you've got one representation regardless of ecosystem. I can describe Maven or NPM or uh, Red Hat package managers, uh, pretty much everything. But it's really important. Um, I know um, Cyclone DX supports it, Dependency Track supports it, Sonotype OSS Index supports it, Red Hat is in the process of supporting it, a few other uh, folks. Uh, but basically, it is a decentralized URI. It actually conforms to the URI specification. Um, there are a bunch of parsers uh, out there. I wrote the official Java version of that, and I'm also part of the um, the group that are that's helping define the specification. Uh, but there's implementations for, for JavaScript, for Ruby. I think there's a Python, there's a .NET one out there. So definitely go check it out. So dependency track, um, once you actually ingest your bill of material that's top left, we work with the, the multiple sources of vulnerability intelligence, and we also do the outdated version detection. So once you actually have the bill of material in dependency track, uh, we're going to constantly analyze that. Now, every time you upload a bill of material, we're going to analyze it. But if you don't upload a bill of material, we're still going to analyze it every 24 hours. Um, but it doesn't do anybody any good if the information just sits there, right? So we've got um, notification support. So you can actually get Slack or Microsoft Teams notification. The really interesting thing, though, is to be able to automate your response. So we have webhooks, and the data that we actually provide in webhooks allow you to do some really interesting things. So for example, if you have a library and uh, you discover that it's vulnerable, well, you can automate uh, that response so you can send the webhook out. And um, maybe it's a library and maybe it's a minor version, so you might, in that particular case, you want to automatically do a pull request to update to the latest version. 
or maybe it's a framework or it's a mi major version update. So in that case, you might want to, uh, the business response is going to be to automatically create a JIRA ticket to go into the team's backlog to fix. So it's really up to you how you kind of use that functionality, but we provide a ton of data that you can really use uh, via the webhooks. We do have our own Jenkins plugin now, um, and uh, for ThreadFix customers, you actually get a ThreadFix remote importer um, from Denim Group, supported by Denim Group. Um, we're working on other um, vulnerability aggregation things as well. Uh, Kenna security support is coming up, and uh, I will be writing a uh, Fortify SSC uh, plugin as well, so you'll be able to get your static analysis results and your component analysis results in a single pane of glass. Questions before the demo? And please pray to the demo gods for me. <laughs> Right. So the question is, how can you use uh, package URL or Perl to query for vulnerabilities um, just using that string, right? So um, dependency track actually in Cyclone DX um, really put, puts a big focus on, on package URL uh, just because it's a standardized representation of any component. Um, we treat package URL as kind of a router. Right, so um, if I have a component that I know is of the NPM variety, I'm gonna automatically use NPM audit API. You don't have to know that. It, the system just does that for you. Whereas if I have uh, something that has like Maven, I might choose to do OSS index. If I don't have a package URL, I'm gonna use dependency check internally and do my fuzzy matching voodoo stuff against the NVD to try to try to pull some, some of that stuff back. So package URL is really, really important. Uh, OSS index, the service provided by Sonotype, actually uses package URL natively. You have to use it in order to use a service, and that's how we integrate with them. It's really simple, actually. Um, it doesn't have to be, um, it, unlike a URL, it doesn't have to be resolvable. So essentially what you do um, is in the case of Maven, for example, the uh, it's going to be PKG colon you know sla uh, colon Maven, and then slash the group, slash the component name, uh, at sign the version. That's it. Uh, the group is optional in a lot of ecosystems. For example, in uh, in NPM, the organization or the the group is an optional thing. In things like NuGet, it doesn't exist, right? So you just omit that. Yeah, it's really simple. Yeah. So does the memory show up in the for future versions? Yep. So can you cover what do you mean? So that's a great question. So the recommendation, regardless of whether or not you have vulnerabilities in your components is always going to be can keep components up to date. Um, it's a best practice um, from just a hygiene perspective because you get performance and, and bug fixes and all that, but when you have something like struts or a spring that gets popped, especially struts, all the time, um, you need to be able to respond within hours sometimes or, or less uh, because those things are typically weaponized within a few hours, right? Um, so it's really important for you to keep those things up to date on a very consistent basis because if I'm a few versions bef behind, I now may have to deal with API changes to do that upgrade. Whereas if I'm continuously upgrading, you know, I can just, you know, update the thing and uh, I can probably not even test, right? I can just go forth and, and, and deploy. But the question was really about the uh, the, the known vulnerabilities that are, that are not in a thing like the NVD, which is about 90% of all vulnerabilities. Um, that's a really hard problem to solve. Um, there's a lot of really good commercial sources of vulnerability intelligence 
Uh, Sonotype, uh, Nexus IQ, for example, has some really good stuff. Uh, Snyke, uh, who I'm actually in the process of, of trying to integrate with, they actually have some really good stuff as well. Um, for example, um, uh, package URL with Snyke, um, they actually have REST APIs for each ecosystem. So like the REST API for NuGet is different than the REST API for Maven, it's, it's crazy. But uh, if they were to standardize on package URL, you wouldn't have to worry about um, you know, what ecosystem that package is, is actually, and you have one API that you can then, then query. I'm trying to get them to support that. But uh, I think the package URL really has a, a, really a really big potential impact for things like commercial sources of vulnerability intelligence. So VulnDB, for example, is a commercial source of vulnerability intelligence that we integrate with. They had, what was it, 6,000 vulnerabilities in their database that weren't in the NVD in 2017. We support that. So um, yeah, and it's only going to get better. Right. As software acquisition tools and use cases. Right. So there's a lot of discussion about the different support in case that's out right now, right? Right. Like Are you on those working groups? <laughs> Some of you guys will be in the working group. But yeah. We are Right. Yeah, so there's actually a couple working groups going on right now at the, um, in the federal government. I'm actually part of two of those working groups that are discuss discussing software transparency at the government level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, it's a really hard problem to solve because there's a lot of use cases. Um, Cyclone DX um, doesn't handle every single use case. It's not designed to. It's really designed for that minimal viable product uh, for you to be able to generate the bill of material from your build system in a very easy, automated way to get results. Uh, SPDX, you know, it's again, it's an older standard. Um, it's supported by things like Black Duck. Uh, it's supported in dependency track. It was designed not for software security. <coughs> so there's the, the package URL and some of these other fields isn't, aren't in the specification. Oh, yeah, it's... Um, but version 2.2, they're actually adding some of these things. So we'll, we'll see where it goes. Uh, software ID, or SWID, uh, I don't support because the specification is behind the paywall. So if they ever change that, I'll support the specification. Vulnerability to the database? Yeah. You can. Yes. Yeah, so if you want to, as an organization, if you want to create your own internal um, private vulnerability database, you can do that today. Yes. Third-party JavaScript to the URL, like to package URL. Yeah, so it'll just be package uh, PKG. Uh, where's that? Uh, let's see. Um, so it would literally be package npm, uh, the optional organization. So the organization, the optional organization would be there uh, if you had one slash whatever the name of the component is, at version. That's really it. Um, and there's actually a Cyclone DX um, um, NPM module that will automatically create your bill of material from package JSON. So if you have a, a, um, a, a node project, you can actually create all of that with one command. But the HTML wasn't for the JavaScript to trigger it? What's that? Well, if it's a if you're building with npm, if you if you're using a, a JavaScript package manager, right, it'll it'll do everything for you. If you're using unmanaged dependencies, that's that's an entirely different problem. Yeah, like trying to figure out what JavaScript does. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's that's a different problem. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, dependency check, it's not a bill of material. Um, it, it does provide a report that does have the, some of that information in there. It's not a true bill of material. It's limited and um, it's inconsistent. So for example, if I uh, were to scan a package JSON with dependency check, uh, the dependencies and the uh, transitive dependencies are actually represented differently than some of my other components. So I don't necessarily get all the information that, that, uh, that I really need, nor does it support package URL, which is really important. There is a, a backlog item for the dependency track or dependency check to support uh, package URL. And if they ever do support it, um, you know, I'll be able to uh, um, support that a much. For URL, you mean the digital uh, size of the URL? For, for accurate results, yeah. If you want, there's really two interesting use cases for this. So like if you want very specific actionable results without a lot of noise, if you want a very clear signal to noise ratio, use Cyclone DX and um, use, you know, the Maven, NPM, whatever to generate it um, and use NPM audit and OSS index and disable dependency check. Now, if you want to cast a wider net and be able to get environmental things, or maybe you are working on a legacy project that doesn't have Maven or whatnot, then in that case, turn on dependency check and uh, it'll find those types of things, but at the uh, expense of false positives. Um, uh, sorry, quick question. Yeah. Uh, how does the tool handle uh, um, uh, the notification and the tracking of issues if I, like let's say I submitted my bomb a, a, a month ago and there is a vulnerability today, does it notify me? Does it allow me yeah. you know, to customize who else would be notified and so on? Yeah, so the, uh, the notification support, um, it actually keeps track of the, all the history of the components and the vulnerabilities. It also keeps track of all of the analysis decisions that you've made. So for example, if you have a bill of material that you ingested like a month ago um, and there was no vulnerabilities and a month later there is, uh, if you have a notification configured and it's like a two minute process to configure them, but if you have a notification configured, um, you can get a Slack notification, Microsoft Teams, webhooks. We also support email notifications if you want email. Uh, it's really up to you. Does it allow acknowledgement that uh, I received a notification and yes, I addressed it? No. 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 Eventually there will be, um, there will be like Jira integration with bi-directional thing. I accept pull requests. Yeah. So last question. So how can we find out what's inside the bill of material? What I mean here is that, for example, you mentioned stress too, right? Mm -hmm. I, they pay attention to stress too. But a lot of people don't know, like JSON data band actually inside stress too. So whenever JSON data band has some vulnerability coming up, how can we, you know, notify stress too and, uh, you know, get it fixed? So what's, what's the question specifically? It's like, the, what's the second level dependency? What's the inside of your material? Right, right, right. So, so do you have any tools to do that or do you have any suggestion? Right, so when you generate the bill of material, it is basically a flat representation because that's what a bill of material is. Um, so it's bill of material is not a dependency tree, first and foremost. Um, it is just a flat representation yeah, of like first level. What in included, yeah. right? But it but that it does include all of your transitive dependencies. So when you do create the um, like Maven or NPM, uh, if when you do create your Cyclone DX bill of material, you will get all of your transitive dependencies. But do they know like JSON data? But actually, it's under Struts too. It's under Struts too. Probably yeah, transitive, yeah. Yes. Yes, they you, will. You do have the relationship between these two? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's in there. All right, let's, uh, how much, we've got five minutes? Yeah, seven. Seven minutes? Okay. <coughs> okay. 
Okay, so here is the main dashboard for dependency track. Um, I am going to go ahead and create a project. Um, uh, let's do webcode. And this is version 8.0 of webcode, I think. Um, okay, so I've got an empty project in dependency track. Um, I've got a Jenkins installation over here and I've got a job. Let me just show you the configuration of the job here. So this is OS WebGoat. Uh, looks like I'm pulling it from, um, I might not want to do that because I don't want to rely on the internet right now. Um, and um, I would normally end up building right, uh, building WebGoat, but in this particular case, I just want to generate the bill of material with all of my transitive dependencies. Um, so this is what this does. So it just calls out to the, to the Maven plugin directly. Ideally, this would be in your Maven profile or part of your, your build step. Um, the next thing I wanna do is I wanna publish my results then to uh, dependency track. It's automatically going to populate my full list of projects. I only have one to find there. And I know that the bill of material will be in my Maven target directory, and it will be called bomb.xml. So let's save that and run it and pray to the demo guys that uh, it works. OK, so right now it's making an aggregate of um, uh, of all the um, components that are in there. See how long this takes. Uh, I'll come back to that. One thing that you can do with dependency track or track is it actually maintains a full list of all the vulnerabilities. So if you want to do um, um, analysis on things in the NVD, right? Um, so for example, uh, CVE 2018 something or other, right? So this one's is high severity. Um, you get all the metadata about what it is, right? You get the base impact exploitability scores, um, links out to uh, NIST for that. But you also get, if I, if I had any projects in my portfolio, in my enterprise, right, uh, you'd actually get a list of all your affected projects. So um, if you were to use this to monitor, like for example, all of your commercial uh, software, right, uh, a lot of organizations have hundreds, if not thousands of applications that they use that they didn't develop. Well, now you can, instead of when that next heart bleed comes out, right, you don't have to call every vendor because that's not scalable. You can now look at dependency track and see which applications across your enterprise are actually affected. Okay, so this is done. It looks like it created my bill of material and it published the artifact to dependency track. So let's, let's go back to that project that I created. There you go. So I've got a bunch of vulnerabilities now. <laughs> If I go in here, um, so these are all my dependencies. Uh, some of these things it may not be able to resolve. Um, these things will tell you whether or not it's out of date or not. The little green ones tell you that it's, uh, it's actually the, the latest version. Uh, and then you can go over to audit. And these are all of the findings that it found. So I can go over to, uh, looks like I'm using an, a, a vert a vulnerable version of uh, Tomcat. So you can go into the each vulnerability here and make your analysis decisions. Again, just like a static analysis tool. You can mark things as being exploitable, suspicious if it's under investigation, not affected, right? Yeah. Uh, correct. So uh, it, it really depends on the source of vulnerability intelligence, like um, OSS index, 
provides um, a lot of that. Uh, the NVD obviously does. Um, Node security platform used to, NPM no longer does. Um, so with NPM, for example, you don't get some of the CBSS scores, nor do you get the vectors. So those pretty little graphs and stuff, you, you no longer get with NPM. Yeah. What's that? Well, you're always going to, if it's a, if it's a publicly disclosed vulnerability, you're always going to have a CVE or some kind of unique identifier. Uh, Sonatype, for example, has, um, they actually use U UUIDs. Uh, NPM is just, um, you know, one through whatever. Uh, the NVD uses CVE dash something or other. Uh, so depending on your source of vulnerability and intelligence, you're always going to have a unique identifier. Yeah. How do you recheck the version? Is there a version to the vulnerable version? How do you do that? The, vul the vulnerable versions? Yeah. We don't track. That's, uh, that's, that's yeah. almost impossible to track without human intervention. Because, yeah, because CPEs are completely unreliable, and the, the NIST is trying to get rid of them, right? Yeah, they have the same conclusion. Right, exactly. Um, yeah, CPEs are, are, have long outlived their usefulness. Um, they were good for a time. But um, it really depends on the, your source of vulnerability intelligence. Like if you, if you use NPM, right, if you've got a node project, it'll actually tell you in the, in the vulnerability information what things you should actually update to. If you're using Sonotype OSS Index, they don't provide that information to non-paying customers, right? Right. Yeah, so you can actually go to, like, if you go to the CVE, right, it'll actually tell you what CWE it, it has. Yeah, so we have that. Yeah. Well, they're always going to be a unique identifier, regardless of the source of vulnerability intelligence. Always. Yeah, it works similar to static analysis. So the question was, what happens when you constantly uh, uh, upload bombs to the dependency track, right? It works very much like static analysis, where you're analyzing a bunch of code and you upload you know, your, your code for analysis. Um, when you do that, it's basically, a, a, uh, um, it's basically the equivalent of stating, these are everything that I am up, uh, have as, as components. Uh, it is not an additive process. Um, when you update your, your bill of material, right, if, if you're no longer using something, it'll drop off. If you are using something new, it will be added. And for the things that remain the same, it will maintain that history across, you know, forever, as well as your, your, your full audit trail. It's language agnostic. Yeah, so we don't care what language uh, that you're using. It doesn't really matter. Um, what more matters more in that regard is really the source of vulnerability intelligence. What can they do? One last question before we got to go. Correct. That's a great question. Right now, they list them separately. In the future, it will try to correlate them. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it.